Um, so I was born and raised in North Carolina, not in this area of North Carolina, but near Raleigh. Um, so much wealthier, whiter area of the state. And I didn't learn about this issue until I went to college and started studying the impacts of um, industrial animal agriculture on the environment. And I wanted to write my undergrad thesis on that, uh, on a topic relevant to my home state along those uh, along that that line. Um, and so I wrote my thesis on this. And then several years later, I was working at a nonprofit as a video producer. And my colleague Sean, the, the director and my co-producer. Um, came to me and said, I think we should do a feature. Do you have any ideas about what we should do it on? And this immediately came to mind for me. I had been familiar with Elsie and her story and a number of the other subjects of our film. I had interviewed for my thesis and was you know, familiar with them. Um, and when I had originally discovered this issue, I was so struck by it. I was so heartbroken and really shocked that even just, you know, I lived about an hour and a half down the road from where uh, most of our filming took place, you know, even just that short distance away, I had not been familiar with this. And I think most that's the case for, you know, many people even in North Carolina, as well as across the country, we don't know what impact, you know, that our food has on the people who live near these facilities. And the more I learned, the more I understood that, you know, while we we were intentional about focusing on Eastern North Carolina. This is an issue that is becoming much more uh, widespread around the country and around the globe. So we wanted to tell a human story, focus on the community, but also, you know, bring to light an issue that affects really all of us. Well, you did that so beautifully. And um, I really appreciated the way that you brought in, you know, sort of the both sides um, and having that that wonderful you know hog farmer who you know spoke so forthrightly about the damage that his farm was doing, um, and and how did you find him? He's he's such a fascinating character. He has been quite outspoken about the industry and its impacts on people, and even you know as he says in the film, the impacts of his own farm on his neighbors. So he's 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 become quite a public figure which in a way I think is actually what has protected him from the retaliation against the industry that many other farmers would otherwise be subject to. I think the fact that he's been so vocal, they know that if they took any action against him, you know, it would be quite obvious that they were retaliating. Um, he has been harassed. He has been kind of stalked and, you know, definitely has felt quite intimidated by the industry, but he he's an honest man, you know, and he, I think, uh, uh, you know, soon after getting into this business, realized it, it really wasn't all that it, he had been promised. And um, unlike, unfortunately, you know, um, Don Webb, the other farmer, Tom wasn't really able to get out of it. And that's the case for so many farmers. You know, we really wanted to illustrate that they are also victims of this system. That They are not necessarily, you know, to blame for this because many of them have, you know, have no other option to keep the land that they own and keep it in their family. Um, and they enter into these really restrictive, exploitative contracts with these companies. It's very difficult for them to get out of those. Um, but Tom, you know, doesn't let that stop him from speaking the truth. Quite extraordinary. And I love the way that you, um, you know, sort of layered the film and the complexity of the issue because, you know, as you say, you know the hog farmers aren't are are, are also in some cases actually victims, um, and you know then there's the other side which is you know jobs, um, and and you know food sources. Uh, so it's very complex, you know. And I you know I really appreciate sometimes you see films that are so one sided, and you know you really captured the nuances, I, I suppose it was, you know, a lot of it was your research um, and, you know, the depth of the research and um, that, that you did. Was it hard to get Elsie to participate in the film? It wasn't difficult to get her to participate, but it was difficult to get her to go deep enough with us. She is a very private, was a very, very private person. And I think she did that um, 
we don't know, I don't know for sure. She never really explained this to us, but my kind of theory about that is that she really did that as kind of a protection mechanism for herself and for her family. She kept her activism very separate from her personal life. And I think for us, she saw, you know, she saw this, she saw participating in the film as, as activism. So she, you know, the first time we met with her, she just kind of gave us all the sound bites and I think, you know, what we realized is that she and many other people in the community were used to filmmakers like us and journalists and others coming in, wanting to get a specific story and taking that and extracting it and leaving and never coming back. So it took us a long time to build trust with her and with our other subjects because they had been so used to this, especially I think white filmmakers from, you know, out of town coming in, taking what they needed and leaving. And we wanted to, you know, we had to show them that we were much more invested in this. <clears throat> we filmed for over four years. So that that took a long time. But even still, Elsie, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't really open up to us very much and you know she we tried to get her to introduce us to her friends or her family and it really actually wasn't only until it wasn't until after she passed that we were able to meet some of her family members and talk to them and they were scared you know they one of um actually the Elsie's niece in the film Jesse May told us that she works uh she's works as a lunch lady at a school and Smithfield has a lot of connections to leaders at the school. And she was afraid that if she would speak up that she would actually lose her job. And that's a, that's a story we heard over and over and over again. So many people were unwilling to speak with us because they, you know, had their livelihoods on the line or their family members' livelihoods on the line. And I think for Elsie, like she said in the film, like sometimes you just have to step out on faith. If you know that what you're doing is right, you have to speak up and, I'm grateful that she did speak up to us and was, you know, able to be part of the film and eventually opened up to us more and more over time, but it took it took years. Yeah, it really is so striking, you know, the bravery, her bravery and, you know, the bravery of, of the other, you know, activists. Um, did you and your team ever feel at risk? Did you ever feel intimidated or... Yeah, we, we definitely did, uh, especially in that one scene where we were tracked down by the cops. That was me in the driver's seat just trying to, you know, move on from that situation as, as quickly as we could. We had encounters like that a couple of times where, you know, farmers would, the farmer in that case, actually, he kind of led a parade of, of cops toward us and kind of pointed out our car and then they swooped in and surrounded us. So um, I think that that just really illustrated the fact that the um, the law enforcement and the industry are one and the same in this community. And for us, you know, as white folks filming this, that was very intimidating, but I, I can't even imagine the level of fear that that invokes in the people who live there, the black residents who live there to have the police, you know, potentially um, take action against them on behalf of the industry that's destroying their lives. So we were intimidated. We had a, um, we were filming in front of a, a house once kind of going back and forth, getting a shot of a factory farm in the background and had the man just come out and pull, cock a shotgun. We we're like, okay, we get the message. Um, but the, you know, the fear I think there was really, was really palpable and it was it was scary for us, but we had the protection in a way of our of our skin color and not being from that region and, you know, being wealthier than a number of the folks there. So we, you know, had to be really conscious of that power that we had to coming into that community and not take it for granted and not abuse it. I think that's something that is really tricky for filmmakers, especially if there's a race difference or a class difference. You know, you have to we had to really work on ourselves to make sure that we weren't exploiting that power differential with, between us and our subjects. And that was, that was definitely difficult too. Yeah. I think you feel that respect in the way that you are telling the story. Um, so how did you, I see that, uh, David Lowry and, uh, and, uh, uh Kate Mara are involved. How, how did they get involved in the project? So Sean is um, very close friends with David Lowry. They they go back a while. Sean's worked on a number of his films. Um, so he's been involved since the very beginning, mostly just as kind of someone Sean went to for advice here and there. Um, and then Kate, 
also came through uh, a connection that Sean had. He had worked with her and her sister Rooney Mara and her husband Joaquin Phoenix a number of times and it was actually Rooney and Joaquin who saw the film and were kind of interested in getting involved in some way and passionate about it but we didn't really have a specific way that we wanted them involved and we weren't sure you know what they could do but Kate I guess ended up seeing it as well and the story goes that she had a dream one night <laughs> about the film and woke up and just said I have to I have to be a part of this I really want to put my name on this and help help you know spread the word and um, she helped connect us to Cory Booker for that interview and she came out for that which was really special um, she's been a good good advocate for the film as well. That's great. What's next for the film? Well, we're screening at festivals. This is our last one of the year, but we've had a lot um, over the fall, and it's it's been wonderful to travel around with it. Um, and then next year, you know, we're going to be doing a few more fests, probably in the spring. Um, but we're also really trying to work on doing a lot of community screening. So we're working with, um, you know, as many kind of local or grassroots organizations as well as national organizations, um, as many of those as we can to bring the film to people who are fighting this on the ground, whether advocates, you know, for clean water or social justice, you know, um, racial justice or um, you know, animal rights, we've, we kind of are trying to reach a, as broad an audience as possible through those kinds of screenings. Um, we are fundraising for that. So if you're interested in supporting us, a lot of people think, you know, the, the work is done when the film ends, but we have no money left. So we're really trying to, you know, raise some more funds for, you know, the ability to actually keep having people see it on the ground and have people come, come in person to see it, which we've found to be really powerful. Um, and then hopefully, eventually, we will have it, you know, picked up by a major streaming platform. We're in initial talks with at least one so far and keeping our fingers crossed, but it's tough for documentaries these days, so we'll see. But our, our goal is to make it as widely accessible as possible. So if people want to help, if people want to help, how, how can they do that? Where can they go um, to, to donate or to get involved? Yeah. Uh, so you can go to our website, which is smellofmoneydoc.com. We list all of our screenings uh, on, the, on that site, both festival screenings as well as community screenings. And we're always um, doing our best to try to get the word out about screenings, to pack the room as much as possible. So if you know folks in any of the areas where we're having screenings and you want to invite them out, that's always appreciated. We really, we really uh, are grateful for that kind of support. And then there's also a, a donate link on our website. We are fiscally sponsored um, by the International Documentary Association, so all donations are tax deductible. Uh, yes, question. You briefly mentioned the Chinese. You briefly mentioned the Chinese bought that facility, uh, but there was no further reference to that. Did you have any experience with the Chinese, either in the defense, the litigation, and all of that? Yeah, good question. Um, the Chinese actually bought a Chinese company. Actually, bought Smithfield, the the pork company, um, but. I don't know how involved the Chinese part of the operation was in the lawsuit. Um, I'm sure there was connection there. <laughs> um, but no, we, we didn't end up getting to, we were hoping we could interview the CEO of the Chinese corporation, which would have been really interesting, but he was, he's not a very accessible person as you can imagine. And we did try to interview many, we reached out many times to interview spokespeople from Smithfield and kept getting pushed away by them. Um, but yeah, it is, it is an interesting element. There are so many of those that we wish we could have gone into in more depth in the film. And that's definitely one of them. Question? So as the film ends, they win the lawsuit, but yet they're still doing all those, Smithfield is still doing all those same practices and they're still polluting. Has there been any change in terms of th those practices changing? And Unfortunately, nothing really has changed. Um, we've gone back to visit some of our subjects, you know, in, in recent months and the spraying of the waste and the pollution is just as bad as ever. In fact, it's, in my opinion, a little bit worse because I think the industry was on its best behavior during the lawsuits. And now that that's over, they're just like, okay, it's a free for all again. Um, 
and you know we see you see a lot of large numbers in the film about the amounts that the plaintiffs won but those were dramatically reduced by a law passed by um or introduced by a, a state uh legislator who is in bed with the pork industry um so they actually didn't receive very much money most of the plaintiffs you know renee miller one of our main subjects is still driving a school bus. She could barely pay some, you know, pay off some of her medical bills, basically. So, you know, not enough money to even move if they wanted to move. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, the conditions are just as bad as ever. Thank you all so much. Um, and thank you, Jamie, for a beautiful thank film. You.